name is Christy Fierro. I'm in the e-learning department at Tacoma Community College as the Instructional Designer and Open Education Resources Coordinator and have the joy of supporting e-learning with helping put together the conference and I'm not surprised that we're sold out today, but we are still impressed. You are the most dedicated people and I admire you so much. To be here on a Friday, for most of you it's spring break, I just get chills thinking about how much you care about student success and it really means a lot to me and your students. So we decided to do something a little different today instead of having the traditional keynote to have a panel of innovative thinkers. Uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education and other things that we follow have a difficult time capturing I think what's coming next and we try to think of what's coming next to be prepared for our students. And I think what's coming next is going to come from leaders like you in the room. I call the dedicated dreamers. So we pulled together some faculty members and an amazing product manager from Canvas. And we want to ask them today, what inspires you and how do you stay innovative? Scott Dennis, our keynote speaker yesterday, was very accurate that we have a reputation outside of this state for staying innovative. But when he asked me recently how I stay innovative, it, gave me pause. I'm like, what, what is it that I do? <laughs> what do we do? And I want to hear from others. How do you stay innovative? Because we keep moving forward. And so we're going to hear from the panel today. From Tacoma Community College, we have Latoya Reed. Latoya teaches English at, in our Dev Ed program. And one of the reasons that I wanted to ask Latoya to be on the panel is how she inspires me that she's always doing something new that leads to deeper student engagement. We have a celebration in this room at the end of each quarter called Celebration of Learning where these tables are classes of students showing off their work. I highly recommend it. And every time I come by, Latoya's students are doing something new I haven't seen before and it's often something that she saw in a 900 level class scaffolded down for 90, 80 level classes. So she's really uh, creative at finding ways to engage students. So I wanna thank Latoya for being here today. And I wanna have the other faculty members, e-learning people, introduce them. Hi, I'm Tina Torres. I'm from Edmonds Community College. I'm in the e-learning area. And I wanted to introduce my hip chick right here, Kimberly Lothian. She hails all the way from Everett. Um, she is our new instructional designer and she's also um, been faculty for Edmonds Community College for about five years. She also teaches um, at Shoreline, but she loves Edmonds better. Just wanna put that out there. Um, anyways, I, the, when they, we were looking for innovative um, faculty, the first person that came to my mind was Kimberly. She is a hip chick. And um, she just is always doing something really cool, and she has made a complete difference in our e-learning area. And the faculty love her, I love her, um, and you guys will all love her. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Griffith from the e-learning department at Lower Columbia College, and I'm here to introduce Lucas Myers. He is a biology instructor at LCC, hails from Castle Rock, Yes, yes. <laughs> um, also, he's an extremely innovative person. His Twitter handle is at biologyjock, if you want to stalk him on Twitter, uh, because he is also an athlete. <laughs> so Lucas has done a lot of innovative stuff in Canvas, and he was one of the people that I thought of when we were looking for folks. He is a pretty young guy. You should ask him how old he is. He's currently working on his PhD as well. and. Uh, one of the coolest things I saw was in his biology class, he patterned it after a zombie apocalypse. So you had to figure out how to um, do <laughs> microbes and all that stuff. I'm not a bi biology person, I don't understand it. So, <laughs> but anyways, this is Lucas. Thank you for welcoming him. Then we asked Kate McGee to come from Instructure and I want to share with you the formal and the informal introduction. Kate is the product manager at Instructure who's been crafting online products for 10 years for companies that include the New York Times, MTV, Huffington Post, and a background in design that makes her especially conscious of aesthetics and usability and has won a lot of awards. 
I want to say informally that I also consider Kate a dear friend, and what I'm really impressed with is how she's an expert in the user experience and cares about our voice in the community. We heard a lot from Scott yesterday about the community, and Kate's in the community listening and is one of the leaders that makes Canvas so easy for us to use while it's still being innovative. And it's fun to get to collaborate with Kate all the time, and I'm glad that she was able to be here with us today. We want this to be really informal and for you to feel free to ask questions throughout. So Tina's gonna be going around with the microphone so that we caption, or we get the audio for the captioners. So please feel free to interrupt. We want this to be a conversation with you, not talking to you, but talking with you. But let's get started. Kimberly, if you'll kick us off. Oh, Kate's gonna get started. <laughs> um, I wanna start by saying thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, basically, anything that Christy wants, I'm just happy to do. <laughs> She calls and I'm here. <laughs> um, so uh, in asking Christy what she wanted us to talk about, you know, she says, well, what is it that inspires you? What keeps you innovative? Um, what advice would you have for others? And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I personally um, have found uh, inspiring and is, and keep, that, that I feel like keeps me innovative is, um, sharing ideas and working with others. Um, Any time in which I can um, get uh, in a group of people, uh, uh, collaborate with them, um, look for opportunities to build on top of, of an idea. Uh, every single time that I have an opportunity to work with other people, what I'm doing gets better. Um, and I have the ability to hear their ideas. Um, and, and one of the things that I think that's also uh, uh, something that I try and reach out for is is looking for the quiet person in the room. Um, often you're going, they have some interesting ideas, there are lots of people who are loud and, the, and it's great to hear what they have to say too, but look for that quiet person. They're often listening, uh, they're often taking in lots of information and have something uh, quite insightful and I, uh, I, I often find that that's a great person to kind of seek out and, and get their advice and, and hear what they have to say. I'm wondering if you guys have had any experience with uh, building uh, projects and ideas with others and anything you would like to add. Yeah, I was going to kind of bounce off that. I was thinking when I go to conferences, often where I get the most ideas or innovation is in a setting like this, um, when you're listening to others and you're like, light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, I could take that and do this. You know, and so for me, it's always listening to what other people are doing and thinking about how can I use that. And how can we take that one step further? And I think that's a big thing, is how can we take that one step further? And sometimes we're often maybe like, oh, this works and it's fine, and we don't think about that next step. So for me, sometimes it's listening, and how can we move that to the next um, step? And then in terms of working with others, I've had the privilege of collaborating with a lot of really amazing and talented faculty and staff as well, which really helps inspire me and stay innovative as well. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm a, a bit of a conference geek, and I imagine that a lot of people in here are as well, because it's your spring break and you're here. Um, but I, I mean, I love, I love, you know, professional development activities, you know, conferences that everything from like the bad coffee to, <laughs> you know, to like, you know, somebody like participants kind of standing up and you know asking session presenters, can you tease that out a bit and um, you know, I, I just love it all. And um, like a lot of teachers, I don't have a lot of time to delve into the research myself. So it's good to attend these kinds of events because um, you're given research-based information from your peers and then they show you how they applied it. You know, all of these strategies um, that work for students. So that's something that, I, that I've really, um, you know, used to help me stay innovative. And then I, I add that to what the students themselves say works for them. Um, you know, as a developmental educator, um, it might be easy to, you know, kind of remediate rather than develop um, and to kind of underestimate the students, but I don't. Um, I actually have really, really high standards for them. So when I go to these kinds of conferences, um, I make sure that 
even if it is, you know, a 900 level project, I think, okay, I can probably do that, um, especially because I have a lot of resources here. I just have to figure out what I need to do to make it work for my students. My turn. All right. So, yeah, I think it's fabulous to be able to work with others. And what inspires me is exactly my colleagues, the people in this room, my students. I mean, I can't say that more than with everything that I'm talking about in terms of what I get from them. When my students tell me, yeah, that worked, I'm like, sweet, that worked. You know, I know it worked. So it's definitely the people around me and the students that inspire me. And, you know, one thing for me to stay innovative and in addition to working with colleagues and attending conferences and the Commons and the Canvas community, all these things that we were just told about, right, and all the ideas we're getting here in the conferences, I honestly make a conscious decision as a teacher every quarter, I'm going to try one new thing. And that's time consuming on my part, right? Like I'm getting all these ideas the next two days. I have two days before classes start on Monday. And I'm going to implement one idea I learned at this conference. So one thing, way that I've challenged myself to stay innovative is I, I decide as a teacher that I'm going to choose one new thing and try it. And if I don't discipline myself to do that, I'll probably keep going, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time, and then I'll just import my content and use that same course and tweak it here, right? So that's one thing that I know has really helped me stay innovative and uh, maybe share a couple examples of working with my colleagues and things that, you know, that have helped me stay innovative. I, maybe you guys can share some examples. I want to hear about zombie apocalypse here in a second. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'd love to echo the incremental improvement. So, you know, choosing that one thing to improve upon. Um, when you look at professional athletes, um, I think it's something like you can get to proficiency within um, something like 500 hours or something of doing an activity. But if you really want to excel, it's that incremental. It's looking at those that, um, small improvements. So for athletes, uh, in their, you know, they're preparing for the Olympic, it's, you know, how do I get off that starting block faster? How do I go around that corner faster? How do I, you know, move my legs or my arms? And it's just looking at those small things. So for us, you know, it's, um, yeah, what's that new thing I'm going to do? Is there something else I can bring into my class that's going to help my students improve? And uh, I just love that. But that's a, I think that always trying to push yourself is a great way to um, uh, stay innovative and, and I think like you said it's so hard <laughs> to to make time for that and so something that I do is uh, I actually block out half an hour on my calendar every morning and it's so painful um, <laughs> but to force myself to like go and you know read something it, that's that's new and different and not necessarily something that has to do with tech or software or education it's um, sometimes reading about architecture, sometimes it's reading about um, gardening. I like to read a lot of design, uh, different things, and I guess that does have to do with work, but, you know, taking that time to go and read other things, and this is uh, in addition to, like, news. I count this different from my news reading. <laughs> so taking the time in your calendar to uh, uh, go and read and see what else is out there. Uh, it's painful, I know, because <laughs> uh, you have that huge list of things that you got to get done. But I think that um, once you get in it, you just love it. Yeah, I think just kind of play off your idea of sports there for me, since Sarah's sharing my embarrassing Twitter handle. Um, the uh, I come from a sports background and coaching, and so for me, I'm always kind of evaluating and reflecting the process every day in the classroom and the quarter. And I'm looking at with the little things that maybe need to be improved and then utilizing the resources that we have or that we can get to improve that. And so for me, it's a constant process improvement, right? And it's always evaluating that. And sometimes we don't take enough time to sit back and reflect on that. We maybe think about it for a minute, minute as we're leaving the classroom, then we go to a meeting and we move on. But for me, it's really important to sit down and think about what am I doing, how are my students doing, what could be improved, and how am I going to do that? And then that can lead to more and more innovation and more and more improvement for your students. I mean, ultimately for me, it's about my students and what, what their future is. Um, and I think we, we had the mention of development versus remediation. And so often we have this deficit thinking towards our students, especially sometimes at the community college level. It's like, this is a 100-level class at a community college. Why are you asking them to do this? 
And my response would be, well, wouldn't you love it if a university professor said that same thing to you about something you're trying to do? You're just a community college faculty. Why are you trying to do this? Um, you know, these are people, and they're capable of doing amazing things. And often they're capable of doing more than we can do, but we're not willing to let them do it. So for me, it's sitting back, reflecting, um, and I often call it taking the handcuffs off my students, letting them actually do things in my classroom. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and I can get to the, the zombie thing later. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't agree more. I've had, um, surprisingly enough, not from students, but I've had um, some other people kind of say, well, you know, that's a project that you got from like a, a graduate student presentation. Like, why would you do that for your developmental, uh, developmental English students? And I and I simply say, well, because I can. And also um, because the students, even if they they may um, need development in certain areas, they they do understand the importance of developing lots of different literacies all at once. You know, they get it. I mean, they're they're on you know Twitter and they're on Instagram and they are they are totally immersed in these these uh, this digital media. And so, as an English instructor, it's really important for me to to kind of stay fresh when it comes to developing their their research skills and their writing skills by integrating those kinds of those kinds of projects into my classroom. Um, and I just wanted to kind of add to your point about incremental learning, just because it's really poignant for this, um, this conference. I came here last year, and um, you know I was new to the state. I had never worked with Canvas before, so I really needed some help because my students were like, "Can you please use the learning management system?" Like it's like I don't understand this whole. You want me to hand in a piece of paper to you? I don't get that. So. Um, so before I came to the conference, I just kind of had to like do like a like a really quick, you know, let, what is Canvas? Let me just kind of figure it out. And then coming to the conference, um, you know, gave me some really like deep skills. Um, there was a Do Not Fear the Code uh, session, which is running this this today actually. Um, I believe that's yours, right? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, I, you know, I never had an interest in coding, but I was like, ah, right, let's just see. He says it's two hours, I can learn something, let me see. And I went and, you know, got a list of resources and I spent all last summer just playing around with it and I felt like such a cool nerd, oh my God. <laughs> And and my can and it just it just improved the look and the and the operation of my canvas shells, um, so I, I highly recommend that. And that was just one thing that I promised myself I would do to kind of streamline my instruction. So um, you know I I hope that each of you will take something away from this conference that's like that. This one thing that you can do to kind of um, stay innovative and fresh. Yeah. So after I choose the one thing and spend a lot of time developing it. One thing I do at the end of my quarter is I do a survey on that one thing with my students. And it's short, because I don't want them to feel bogged down by a lot of questions. Rate it, tell me what you like, tell me what you didn't like, and then, do you have any other ideas of technology you'd like me to see me use in this classroom? And I've actually got ideas from just those, you know, four questions of something I could try because maybe they saw another teacher use it or they're using it now. Some of them didn't even know what they were and I had to go research them, right? Uh, but I do think that that's a great way to see whether or not what you're choosing to try actually, you know, works in terms of that. Um, an example, I, I brought a couple ideas with me today. Uh, my students have teach a lot of online classes and they, the drudgery of doing an introduction discussion board. Every teacher has one, right? Introduce yourself, tell me your name, where you're from, you know, whatever, write it out in a discussion board, right? And it was funny because I started thinking about this from a student perspective and, you know, their digital media and how engaged they are. I'm like, why am I having them write this, this out every single time? There's so many different ways they could introduce themselves. They could do it in a video. They could do it with, I used a feature called Padlet. Some of you might have used it before, um, where they can post their picture and then put words with their picture. And, you know, there's other innovative ways, ways to ask them to introduce themselves than just a discussion board in terms of that. Or upload a video. They like to talk on their phones and take a lot of selfies. 
you know? So, you know, use that. You could have a contest. Give me your best selfie. We can vote, you know, those types of things in terms of what's going on. So, and then one thing I did with that information that changed the dynamics in my classroom completely, and I'd never done this before till two quarters again, ago, I've always wondered how you create community in an online classroom. I've, I've been challenged by it. I don't know how you guys feel as a faculty, but I've been challenged by it. And I took the, the, the poster board of all the pictures they had put up and all the words they had used to describe themselves and hobbies that they liked, and I created these groups based on uh, what they preferred. Uh, so I created groups like sports enthusiasts and chef fanatics and pet lovers, and I had these small groups. And instead of making my discussion board a 30-person discussion board, I had them join a affinity group, one that they thought they would relate the most to. And that was their group they interacted with the whole quarter for the discussion board. And there was about eight people to ten people in each group. And it was the first time on my evaluations that I heard students tell me I actually felt like I really got to know these students in my classroom. And that was all from a new way of introducing themselves and a new way of putting together the discussion board. So I just think always thinking beyond and asking yourself what do your students like to do and getting their feedback, you'll be amazed at the things that will come to you as an instructor. So that's one of my ideas. I don't know if you guys have another idea you want to share. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't the true zombie apocalypse, but um, it kind of feeds off what she was talking about there in the sense of community. I teach a um, variety of biology courses, but one of the ones I teach is Biology 160, which is our kind of general biology, but it's really a, a, an intro cell biology class, and you get anywhere from non-majors to um, biology majors if they haven't taken a biology in a while. So. Um, but I teach it completely online, and it's a lab-based biology course completely online. And I've been doing that for a few years. So in terms of creating community, I, I do the same thing in the sense that I put them in teams on Canvas using the group space. And they have their community spaces that they are working as teams in over the whole quarter. And talking about creating community um, through the process that they have to go through with team contracts and setting goals and work plans for the quarter for their projects. Um, I'll, they'll have hundreds of posts in their group space for discussions. And I get to know my students way more there than in any other setting because I see every little thing they do. And they're required to post everything they do uh, and document it in there. Um, but it's, it's quite amazing to see um, the things that grow out of that and the things that emerge once you allow them to have that organic setting to work and to communicate um, and to create their projects. And so one of the things I have them do is they have four different challenges, but one of them is uh, is literally they start the module and it's a video. I'm playing this like scientist with blood on my lab coat and and I'm running into my office and there's scary music and it basically there's a virus that's had an outbreak and it's infecting people and it's um, it's it's an oncovirus so it's leading to cancer but it's causing people to do erratic things and it's going crazy and I I will say that they I had a student email me right after the video and asked me if I was actually at the uh, Oscars the night before, um, but uh, no, it's, it's a terrible video, but, um, but I tried my best, but it engages them, and then, so they're in a team, and they have to figure out all these things and, and produce something, but um, it's through those things that you produce that community. You're asking four or five people in an online setting, completely online, and they, can, they don't have to ever meet face-to-face -face, thanks to Canvas and Google and all the amazing things out there, um, even though they always want to say, well, we can't meet face-to-face. -face. You explain to them all the other things that they can use that they're already using. Um, it's amazing to see the community and the camaraderie and the relationships they build. And I have had multiple students then come back to me and say, thank you, because now in the future classes, we work together. We've, we've built this cohort of people that depend and support each other. And I even had someone email me and say, I've, I now have a best friend from this class who I now rely on from this course. So not only are we, we building that content and that discipline ex expertise, um, but we're building relationships, which is far more important in this world than anything I can give them from biology. I want to thank our panel because this has definitely been fuel for me. If we want to hear from you, what questions, comments? Uh, 
Kimberly, it's a quick question, but at the software that you mentioned, Padio? Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T. And it actually integrates with Canvas. And there's a video, if you search it, that shows you exactly how to integrate it with Canvas. So I actually have it on my course navigational menu. And they just click on it, and it opens up the poster board. And when I teach hybrid, I actually do it as my first day activity. That's how I would do it. And you can do it on their cell phones. I usually give them the URL if they're using their cell phones. And they post it, the picture, they tell me the things about themselves, and then we divide the room up. Everybody that was born in the United States stand over here, everybody that wasn't, and like we just have fun with what we can see on the board. So it's a good way to like do it in the classroom too if you're trying to do it. But it's a, it's a pretty cool tool. Yeah. I actually have a question. So you mentioned your favorite app, Padlet. Do you other guys have a favorite app that you like to use in your class? I have another one. I have like four. So uh, I don't know how much you guys use polling software, but you know the old clickers don't work for me, and everybody has a cell phone. Is my philosophy, um, and if not, I pair them up. You know, there's ways to get around that if you feel like your students don't have that. Uh, but the Poll Anywhere software is free out there. You can use it. And one thing I changed in my um, uh, office hours for online. I usually would open up a conference for my office hours for my online classes and have like a little PowerPoint we could walk through. But the conferencing software in Canvas has a poll feature now. So now I have questions that they get to answer if they're in my office hours. And students go, I love it. Like she's like we're in class and she's asking us questions. And I record it so if other students can't come to the office hours, they can come back and watch it. But I did change using the polling features in terms of um, one of the options that I looked at. Other one? The other, tell us the other two also if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Quizlet, it integrates with Canvas. I love it for my math course. I teach a business pre-calculus course. Uh, it's an LTI that's under the navigation menu. And uh, you can pay $60 a year if you want additional features it comes with the basics so that's kind of your choice uh, but you can create some pretty cool quizzing types of questions and flashcards and things for your students to engage them get the learning like you might do in the classroom but not have be able to be face to face it takes time though to put it together right Marty <laughs> she's trying it out this time so I know I know it takes a little time and then the other thing that I did a lot of Panopto videos for a long time and the one thing that I was always hoping to get was the ability to ask the quiz questions along with it and that's a new feature that just came out in December and probably a lot of us haven't tried it yet so there's a challenge for you maybe you can try something of that nature right um, this isn't it's not an app but um, one of the websites that I really like to use um, is called PictoChart um, which is an infographic maker is free um, I use it myself to create materials for the class and um, this upcoming uh, quarter I'm going to have the students use it as part of a research project. Oh, spell it? Lord, okay. Um, P-I-K-T-O-C-H-A-R-T, PictoChart. And actually for your online class, PictoChart can be a cool way to make a nice visual syllabi. Um, the, the syllabi, they're not sometimes as interactive, but if you want a nice one page, hey, here's what you need to know, nuts and bolts, get their attention, pick their charts, a pretty cool um, graphic display for that. Um, I was going to say, I, I've used a, a lot of the ones they've, they've said, but um, oftentimes for me, it's not always a favorite app, it's what is the most useful for what I need. You know, it's about figuring out for you, what are you trying to, you, you know, support or fix or improve, and what's out there and what's available. Um, and in my classes, I've transitioned to a lot of very student-led projects, student-led learning. Um, so oftentimes it's them finding apps and things that support their learning um, or asking questions. Um, we tend to rely a lot on Google Drive in, my in any of the apps and things that, it, that are in, in their Google account is where a lot of my students spend their time.
Hi there. I use a lot of the same kind of apps that you do too, but I wonder about accessibility because some of those apps aren't accessible. So I, that's my number one mantra. So a syllabus has to be accessible. Um, so I wonder if that's something that motivates your searching for cool apps. Well, with all the new laws in Washington State, it's a big motivation, I think, as faculty members. So I have become a lot more knowledgeable and, and I look for that a lot more than I have in the past in terms of that. And when I first started using Padlet, I couldn't do it on my phone. And so that's why I started, I played with it and I think it's always good to test it out. And I realized if I gave them the URL versus having them click on the course navigational link in Canvas on their phone, it would work. So I just had to figure out how some of those things, you know, could work in terms of that. But I think it's important to look at it. And I do try to look at it more than I had in the past because it wasn't as in the forefront, right? And now it definitely is. And I would definitely, definitely recommend to everyone the State Board's free facilitated accessibility course that Jess Thompson has put together that is not only a great resource, the design is beautiful. Best class I took. Accessibility 101. Good course. And it's three weeks long. I learned all the basics I needed to know how to do PowerPoints, how to do Word documents, how to do Canvas pages. It's, it's great. Uh, one of the other things I was going to share is, I don't know about on your campuses, but we've been doing a lot of universal design for learning um, in terms of how do we represent that in our Canvas courses, um, how do we create Canvas pages and things that represent that. So one of the things that Marty, who works with me in our Technology Resource Center, we started an intro to online teaching course at Edmonds and this is the first year that we've ever had faculty have to take a course and complete it um, their first quarter while teaching at Edmonds. And in fall quarter we were handed off a course from a group of faculty and e-learning committee that put it together and we got feedback, you know, after the quarter was over and we spent, um, Marty spent a big chunk of time uh, redesigning it and putting it together in terms of giving them options to learn, you know, are they visual learners, are they readers, do they like to research things, right? And setting up the page so that they could go right to the way that they like to learn, still getting the same content and learning, but maybe I just like to watch videos to learn. Or maybe I want to read it all to learn, right? And I think the one of the biggest things that's been to me to be innovative is to think differently about how I set my Canvas pages up and also how I do my assessments. So for example, in one of my business communications classes, I used to always have my, a reflection paper at the end of the quarter because they do all these self-assessments about their learning styles and their communication styles and their personality styles throughout the quarter. And I started thinking, why do I have them write a paper when I'm looking at, I have people that are mechanics in this class, people that are dental hygienists, people that are nurses, people that are business majors. I have a wide variety of individuals and so now I give them an option. They can submit a video, they can do a collage, or they can write a paper. And it really made me start to be innovative in my teaching practice and innovate, um, apply more of the universal design for learning principles than I've thought of in the past. So, it's something else. We have time for one more question. Would you be able to share with us a uh, podcast or a blog that you like to listen to or read on a regular basis that you get good ideas from? Hi. Um, I actually really like Cult of Pedagogy. Um, it, she, it's run by um, somebody who is in K-12, through but a lot of what she's talking about um, is easily applicable to anything that we're doing. She talks about a lot of her favorite apps and, and uh, websites that help her to innovate. And um, she just talks about, like, you know, really interesting classroom management strategies. So, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, I like cultural pedagogy. And then also um, Pinterest, just in general. But... <laughs> 
you know, sometimes I might get distracted, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of really great things on Pinterest and you can find, you know, articles that you can use in the classroom and, and, um, you know, different strategies, different, just different models of projects, student projects. So I just do a lot of pinning and, um, no matter what I'm pinning, I just say it's professional development. <laughs> great. Um, Let's see, uh, there's one that came out earlier, uh, or I would guess late last year. Uh, it's called Revisionist History. It's by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and this, I see some nods in the, in the audience. It, um, for me, it was really inspiring. It's a series of podcasts, kind of similar if any of you listen to Serial and the fact that he kind of uh, carries a story through several different episodes. And it, it really focuses uh, a lot on the education system within the United States and um, kind of the disadvantage that students uh, have when uh, their economic uh, status is uh, low and they and they are not able to get the opportunities uh, early on and how that affects their ability to get into college and uh, some really interesting things about choices around what college to go to based on how that college actually supports lower income families. Um, I would really recommend it. Um, it will really change your, uh, or at least for me, it, it changed a lot of my perspective on um, or supported some earlier uh, or some other ideas that I had. So Malcolm Gladwell's um, Revisionist History. Was it for me, I read a lot of the science education journals and I'm on listservs and I couldn't even tell you the name of them right now because I just scroll them as they come in my email. But um, for if there's any science educators out there or biology, I'm plugged into like the Pulse Network, which is Partnership for Undergraduate Life Science Education. Um, and so they have different regions across the country. But um, they do a really amazing job of sending resources, having resources and having workshops and stuff where we're dealing with you know, not just looking at content, we're looking at pedagogy and how do we improve our life science education. So that's really where I spend most of my, my time looking. We want to thank our panel so much for being willing to be on the stage sharing with us. And thank you for being here. We have another great day. Enjoy the sun.